Hi, everyone. We want to welcome you to today's session. Uh, this is part of a larger series offering mental health and suicide prevention information, support, and resources in response to the global pandemic. My name is Kelsey Schmitz. I work for the University of Washington at the School Mental Health Assessment Research and Training Center, or SMART Center, as the School Mental Health Lead to the Northwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. Uh, the Northwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center and the UW Smart Center are partnering with Forefront Suicide Prevention Center, the Association of Washington School Principals, Drs. Jim and Liz Mazza, who created the DBT in Schools curriculum, Northwest Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports, Sound Supports, and Well Educator to bring you the Wellbeing Series, offering a variety of virtual learning opportunities for kids, families, and educators focusing on mental wellness and suicide prevention. Today's 60 minute session is the first of two Q&A sessions with our new YouTube stars, Drs. Liz Dexter Mazza and Dr. Jim Mazza. You can learn a little more about the Wellbeing series um, by visiting the website uh, here on the slide and checking out some of the other events that we have planned. Um, many of these events have already gotten started and we've been able to quickly post the um, uh, recordings up on our pages. So please feel free to check that out. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to Megan Lucy. The Mental Health Technology Transfer Center was funded by SAMHSA, which stands for the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration in late 2018. The MHTTC network includes 10 regional centers, a National American Indian Alaska Native Center, a National Hispanic and Latino Center, and a network coordinating office. We know that some of you may be joining outside of our region, which is region 10, and we want to make sure that you know about the center in your area where you can access additional training and technical assistance. The Northwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center supports school mental health workforce in Alaska, Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. And this is how you can get in touch with our Region 10 Center. Uh, you'll notice our website where we're posting recordings, our newsletter link, and social media accounts for a variety of ways that you can connect with us. We send out monthly newsletters as well as training and resource blasts, so feel free to sign up to be in the know about what we are offering. Uh, the link will be available in the chat. Um, we will be pushing out links to you through the chat. The chat feature today is just set up so you can communicate with panelists and panelists can communicate with you, but participants um, won't be able to um, communicate with one another. This series, Student Life Skills to Sur Survive and Thrive During COVID-19 and Beyond, offers different ways for you to engage with the Mazas. For several weeks, the Mazas have been broadcasting live from their living room as they teach their own children the basics of emotional regulation and other specific skills. You can tune in on their live YouTube page or watch their recorded sessions. To get those links, you can use the DBT series link at the bottom of this screen. Here are a list of the lessons and the dates when they'll be presented. Uh, perhaps you've joined the Mazas for a lesson, or maybe you've joined them for all of them. If you haven't, that's okay too. Um, they join us today for the first of two Q&A sessions. Dr. Jennifer Stuber, Executive Director of Forefront Suicide Prevention, is going to help with the questions. Before we start taking questions today, we know that several of you submitted some really excellent questions ahead of time. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Liz and Jim who are going to take um, the opportunity to introduce themselves and the curriculum, start by answering some of the questions that were submitted. And in the meantime, we just ask you to continue um, to submit your questions through the Q&A feature. And questions we don't get answered um, today, we will um, put into our second Q&A session. And the Mazas have also um, committed to creating a fact sheet. So um, at this moment, I want to turn it over to the Mazas. Good morning, everybody, or good, good afternoon, depending on where you are joining us from. I'm Dr. Liz Dexter Mazza. I am a clinical psychologist and one of the developers, along with Jim, of the DBT Skills in Schools um, social emotional curriculum, also called DBT Steps A, which is skills training and emotional problem solving for adolescents. I'm Dr. Jim Mazza. I'm a school psychologist and I'm a professor at the University of Washington 
in the school psychology program at, in the College of Education. Great. So we are so glad that you are all here with us today. And let me see if I can just make sure I can see this here better. Okay. So you guys uh, provided some initial questions that we wanted to just kind of go over. And one question was, why are we doing this? And I thought it was really important just to kind of give you a little background on not only why did we develop the DBT Step A curriculum and we so invested in working with schools, but also why did we start doing all of these daily live streams as another project added into our already busy lives with our kids? Right. So do you want to talk maybe first about why we developed the curriculum and then we'll talk about sure. why we decided to do yeah. this? Yeah, so primarily Liz being a clinical psychologist working on the side of therapy when kids get uh, really struggle or young adults really struggle and uh, they are the, their struggles are impacting their, their careers, their relationships, Liz, Liz sees them if she's got availability. As a school psychologist, I'm kind of more upstream and I want to help kids that are in middle school, elementary school, high school, whatever it is, I want to help them develop some of these skills to how to deal with their situations, their emotions, how to deal with relationships before they become her clients five, six, seven years later, right? And so the idea was, is we wanted to put our expertise together to say, hey, look, what we're doing isn't working. So youth mental health problems are getting much worse, including uh, self-harm and suicidal behavior. And our current education system is set up so that we, and health system is set up so that people have to fail and get worse and worse and worse before they can actually get help. And so what we want to do is develop a solution to bring mental health uh, skills to the, uh, to the whole child, not just not having education, just focus on the academic child. Mm -hmm. And so we, we thought in doing, by doing that is that we wanted to provide an upstream approach, right, to give them skills in their toolbox to help them uh, uh, attain their educational potentials and then become leaders in the, in the future. Right. And so that's kind of why we've been working for the last 10 years on getting social emotional learning and our DBT Steps A curriculum into schools all around the world. Why we decided that we should start doing daily live streams is because of COVID-19. You know, a week or two into the stay-at-home orders, we started having experience. First, I had the experience that I was talking to a lot of friends, other parents, some clients about the difficulties and struggles they were having managing their own emotions and the emotions of their family members during this. So after several conversations where I was giving the same advice, providing the same level of support, I decided like, hey, if some of the people we know that are close to us are struggling with this, why don't we start just doing a live stream where we could talk about how parents can you get some support and what strategies they can be using during this stay at home for however long it lasts. So that's why we decided to jump in and do the parenting through COVID-19 live streams um, three mornings a week. And then when we were also working on our kids' school schedule at first, I was like many other parents out there who decided, okay, we're just gonna match the school schedule. We're gonna have them do math from one moment um, per time period to the next, and then they're gonna do language arts, and then they're gonna do social studies. We're gonna have a recess, we're gonna have a lunch break, we're gonna do PE. And we did all that, and that lasted about three days, and we were totally exhausted. And we were, decided that was too rigid. And again, as I was talking to people and just how much anxiety and frustration was <clears throat> happening with folks, we re I realized like, well, they're missing social emotional learning in all of this. The mental health and mental wellness of our students and our kids is one of the things I think is going to be greatly impacted through this time. So we yeah. decided if we get to make the schedule, we get to conclude social emotional learning on it. So we told the kids, we're going to start doing our DBT Steps A lessons with you twice a week. And from there, we decided, well, if we're going to do it for you guys, why don't we do it over Zoom? We can invite some of your friends if they want, are interested in it because their parents said, oh, I wish my kids had that which then led to like, well, if we're gonna invite our friends, why don't we just invite everybody? Right. And kind of went through some trials of trying it on Zoom and that didn't work. So then we went to Facebook Live and that was okay. And then we decided because Facebook Live gave a limited audience, we moved to YouTube Live and really just wanting to strengthen the opportunities for kids to be learning social emotional lear um, skills about emotion regulation, being mindful, lots of radical acceptance. Yeah, uh, we also wanted to strengthen uh, places where maybe the school system doesn't have a strength, right? And so maybe they don't have SCL teachers. And we thought, well, look, if we're the developers of the curriculum and we're going to teach our kids, some of the teachers at these schools may not be, they may not feel comfortable teaching that way through uh, video. So we thought, well, we are. So let's, let's, you know, talk to the school and say, hey, look, you guys can watch us for 45 minutes, you know, or 50 minutes, whatever it is. And that can be part of your class. That can be part of something that you do for educational wise. And so I think that was helpful. And then parents too. I mean, it's hard. I mean, I was really 
impressed at how fatigued we were the first couple of weeks of mm -hmm. COVID-19 and becoming teachers as well as our other jobs, right? And then we were just like uh, pulling our hair out. And so mm -hmm. it was just like, this is really hard because now we're 24 seven together, 24 seven with our kids and we have to keep changing roles, right? And so it's, it's, it's hard that way. So we thought, okay, so let's see if we can't find a way to help support parents too that have similar issues where they're having to juggle their professional role because mm -hmm. they're required to do that and they're having to juggle their parenting role and they often clash right so i think that that's kind of what we decided yeah and so and it's been fun and ultimately the thing that has kind of been super reinforcing on the students classes is that our kids are formally and really learning yeah. and taking in the ex knowledge from the lessons we're teaching them like they've always heard the language around the house and they know some of the skills hearing the, here and there. And now they can actually repeat back to us. They can practice the skills and they're learning it. And that was, that's the biggest reinforcer for us because we wanted to make sure our kids and any other kid that's interested in family that's interested has access to social emotional learning. I would agree. And so, um, you know, the idea for us, especially now, you know, so the why now, because I think uh, Liz is right, but I think that when our kids go back to school and we get to this new normal, because I don't think it's going back to the old normal, mm -hmm. I think that our kids are going to be really anxious about going back to school when somebody sneezes, somebody coughs, right? Somebody has to wipe their nose. I think it's, it, people are going to be kind of on high alert. And so what do we do with that? Because if you're on high alert all the time, your educational attainment is going to be just down. The, and I think the same is going to be for the adults I in agree. the schools because they're going to be on alert of stay, stay apart from each other. You're too close. You know, right. don't, don't touch each other on the playground and kind of having to try to manage all of that. They need to be able to have some skills themselves as adults to be mindful in the moment, to tolerate and regulate their own anxiety or stress around that. So all of us are going to need these skills. And it's one of the reasons we've started talking about, even though it's called parenting through COVID-19, I'm starting to encourage educators to watch as well so that they can learn the same strategies that we teach to the kids. Our goal is just to get skill, everybody skilled up as much as possible so we can help improve right. and maintain the mental wellness um, of adults and kids going forward. Yep. So we had a question that I wanted to answer really fast that somebody asked, what does DBT stand for? That is a great question. We, we're so ingrained in it that we just assume everybody knows what that means. Di it stands for dialectical behavior therapy. And dialectical behavior therapy is a comprehensive cognitive behavioral treatment that was developed um, by Dr. Marshall Linehan for people with pervasive emotion dysregulation. And it has multiple components, including skills training and individual therapy and telephone coaching. And we took the skills training component from dialectical behavior therapy that's shown to be effective with out of control behaviors, impulsive behaviors, right. and also with um, moderate levels of depression, anxiety, ADHD. And we took, took those skills and adapted them into a school-wide universal social emotional learning curriculum. We took all the clinical language out of it so that um, any teacher, general educators could teach these skills. You don't have to have a mental health background, be a counselor or a psychologist to be able to teach them. Right, and we did that on purpose. Actually, we didn't want uh, the mental health uh, counselors, the school social workers, the school psychologists to be teaching. Not that they can't, they can't, they certainly can. What we do know though, is that they get called for other types of emergencies. And so what we wanted to do was to make sure that when there's a class that's going to be giving skills in mental health, that that mm -hmm. teacher looks just like the math teacher, Spanish teacher, or language arts teacher. So that they are the ones that constantly are still in the classrooms with the kids versus the crisis manager, the school psychologist, the social worker who get called away for different things. And then there's no consistency to the teaching of the skills. So I think that was really important. And the other thing that we, we were really aware of was that in conversations in our younger lives now, about 20 years ago, was that that we were having conversations of Liz working with some of these people who I was already identifying as being at risk. And I was thinking like, that is just, why do we have to wait for this kid to self-harm, start using uh, drugs and alcohol and get worse and worse before they get what we know is an effective therapy called DBT. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of the revelation that we had to say, look, this, we are waiting to fail just like the education system does. It's waiting to fail. And we don't want that model. That model means that kids have to self-harm and, and attempt suicide. We're like, that is not where we want to go. So our core at it was to say, look, we'd like kids to stop killing themselves, all right? And so how do we do that? I don't want to wait until they become your clients and your, right? 
or somebody else's client. I want to give them skills ahead of time because all of us have stuff that we go through during our middle school, high school, probably even elementary school. We all have stuff that happens that produce emotional difficulties. Even as parents, we have stuff that happens, right? So these skills were applicable that we could apply them to all ages. And it was just a matter of trying to find the right fit, the right use of words that weren't clinical to put it into a curriculum that uh, a person could teach. Right. Okay. okay. What else do we have for a question? Wait, that's good. Jen, do you have questions? Well, actually, before we get, Jen, if you have questions um, that you want to ask us, that'd be great. I also just want to throw out a, um, a poll really quickly to find out um, from all of you who are here joining us on how many of you have watched any of our DBT Steps A student lessons. If you can just um, respond to that in the chat. And then after we go through that one, I also want to know how many of you watched any of our parenting shows as well. Okay, we'll give you a couple of minutes seconds to, to kind of give that a couple of seconds to fill that out. We won't be doing okay. this. All right. Um, so another question um, somebody asked just about our videos. Hold on, I think they have to do the parent one. All right, let's give them. That was. That that, was they the can first. keep. They can keep doing it while we talk. Okay. Let's do it that way. Yeah, well, you guys, you guys, you guys want to just report the results out for everyone? Oh, yeah, we can do yeah. that. So, yeah. uh, okay. yep. So, poll one, I think, close. How many have watched? So, we've got uh, about 13%. Said all of them. Woo, all of them. Great. Nice. Thank you. Uh, a few, 28% uh, said a few, and then 59% have said they haven't, they haven't watched it. Okay. So, so, so great. Th great. And no problem if you haven't watched it. They are all on our YouTube channel for DBT in schools. We want you to be able to go back there. Someone asked um, how long we are going to keep them online. At this point, we have no intention of taking them down. Maybe something will change and for some reason we have to take them down. Um, but at this point, we want them out there as a resource because we want opportunities for schools and students and families to be able to go and watch um, the skills. I know some people, some of my friends have told me it's really hard sometimes to watch 45 minutes straight with their kids. So I recommend to them, you know, we'll maybe spend one day at dinner where you watch the first 10 minutes where we do a mindfulness lesson and then spend another day right before dinner or during dinner watching 15 minutes and then talking about it. And you can break it down to two sessions or three sessions now that they're all recorded. Um, opportunities for families to learn these skills together in that way. Can I chime in with a question sure. yeah, um, that's relevant to this? Um, so thank you both so much for all that you're doing to, to disseminate this amazing resource to communities. Um, I'm watching it with my kids. Um, they're a middle schooler, actually an elementary schooler, so age 10 and 14. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the things that I found um, is I'm not able to watch them live, right? And so that I've been watching them on video and I just want to point out that they're also going to be available on video or they already are on the mental health technology transfer center website where they're going to be edited and frankly a little bit easier to find than the YouTube channel um, because the YouTube channel it's just it's it's harder to keep them organized but you don't have to watch them in order I wanted to point that out but my question for you is how would you and this is one of the questions that also came in what suggestions do you have forgetting the family to watch it like i would imagine you know most of the people even on this call haven't watched it yet mm -hmm. um and it's going to be a resource that i think is going to be grow in use over time but how do you explain it to kids of different ages um you know that this is really an important thing for us to do as a family i mean i was we were all amazed that you got we've been you've been getting your kids able to do this live <laughs> and so imagine trying to get kids to watch it um, on video and it's you know I, I've been able to get my kids to do it but I'm curious as to what you would say for people in the, in the general population like how do you get kids to watch this with you as a family yep so what do you want to do you want to go first no you go ahead okay so I think the important one of the main pieces is to talk about with parents to your family what's the benefit for everybody in the family the idea is not that hey like hey kids we're gonna watch this so you learn skills so you can be more effective and you're not getting so emotional and up and down and all having tantrums. It is, you know, as a family, we can all improve our ability to communicate and talk about emotions and to understand our emotions better. So this is something I want us to do as a family to help all of us. But I think parents really have to recognize and be transparent when they struggle and that they could use help on it um, as part of that conversation. Right? It's not just something I think is good for us, but here is where I struggle sometimes, and this is where I, I want to learn something, and I want us to do this as a family activity so we can talk about. 
Right. Um, I would probably take the same approach, uh, Jen. And so, you know, I think that we come at it from a, a place of vulnerability. And, and Liz and I both believe that vulnerability is a, is a strength, not a weakness. And to say, this is hard on, on dad, right? And so I want to be a, a, a good parent during this time. This is brand new to me that I'm here 24 seven. I used to go to mm -hmm. my office. I'm, I can't do that now. I want, I don't want to be yelling. I don't want to, I want us to enjoy time. So I'm going to need some help with some of these skills that we're going to watch because I have emotions and I know that you have emotions too. So this is going to be a win-win situation and you and I, my child are a team and I want you to love me and I want to love you as much as we can through this process. And so I'm going to, I'm going to take notes for this. I want you to take notes. And if you're able to watch live, you can actually write right into the chat bar. So we respond to those uh, during the shows as well. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the piece that I do. And then because we have an eight, 12 year old and a 13 year old, we try to make it um, adaptable and uh, I got one different word. We try to make it informative at a level that every one of our children mm -hmm. can understand. So elementary and then middle school. And that's kind of just in our teaching and the curriculum itself, it goes from middle school and high school with a variety of different examples. So I think the key piece is figuring out why this is relevant to your family and your kids' lives. If getting them at first to go all into watching these videos is probably too, potentially too big of an ask, I would start small. One of the things I think made it easier to get our kids involved, not only just because they know this is what we do, is that a year and a half ago, we started at dinner time. Every night we go around the table and we say gratefuls. And what brought us two things that brought us joy that we're grateful for in the day. Right, as and that was one of the ways of increasing their mindfulness, mindful attention to joy they experience in the day. That's one of our skills, and we started doing that regularly every night. Recent this yeah. week, we started adding in like, what are you grateful for, and where did you build mastery today? Where did you, you know? And so we're weaving it in, but by doing that, the skillful language is already a part of their vocabulary and expectations. And we also weave in their own experiences. So we're using experiences. And so when I'm teaching the class or Liz is teaching the class, we're using our kids experience that happened just 24 hours ago, or say two hours ago, we're saying, okay, that emotion, you got into emotion mind because you couldn't have, you couldn't have the breakfast that you want. You got into emotion. Mind. And so we use things that are very tangible to them or very, I mean, very real to them. Right. And so we ask, we ask as an instructor, as a teacher, we say, so where could you, where did you see yourself in emotion mind? And as each one of our kids can identify that, mm -hmm. now we've got something to hold on to and then we can apply the rest of the skills to it. If they say, I don't know, oh, I remind them very quickly about the time that they've been emotional, right? And I can do that pretty much within the last 36 hours. And so we, we try to make it applicable that way. And it's okay if the kid wants, if your, your kiddo wants to remind you the last time you got emotional too. So that, that's okay, right? Mm -hmm. Because then we can say, you're right, I could use this skill too. And so I think that piece is the important part to say that dad needs this, mom needs this, all of us could use this. And so how do we make that work together? Does that help answer your question, Jen? Yes, that, that's a great question. Um, I, think, I think it would be helpful. Would you guys mind doing the third polling question around who's, mm -hmm. who's on this call so we can figure out how to direct some of the additional questions that came in beforehand since there's so many? Yeah, great. Go ahead and fill that out. Okay, what is your role? Parent, educator, both, other? We got a lot of... A lot of both. A lot of both, right? I'm, okay. I'm impressed. Okay. So I'm gonna read, read that out to you, Jen, okay? Okay. Uh, we've got 20% uh, parents, 20% educators, 54% both, and we've got 5% other. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm, I'm sorry people. for you that are in that both category. Just, just kidding. <laughs> well, <laughs> Thank you for like all you're all doing. All of us are both now, right? Yeah, I am now both. the educator <laughs> and the parent. Yeah, maybe they're not mutually exclusive categories no, anymore. Not anymore. Exactly. exactly. Okay, so let me let me just then go to some of the parenting que relevant questions. And also, I just encourage folks to please chime in on the Q and A if your needs aren't being met in terms of the questions that have been that I'm asking uh, Jim and Liz. Um, so there's a question here about, are there any plans for a book on DBT skills, a design for parents, or have you already answered that question in the sense that, um, you're suggesting that both parents and kids watch this together? So yeah, yes and yes. 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 And yes. We're Liz and I are trying to find, uh, any cloning machine that we have. Yeah. So if you have them out there, please, uh, let us know. That would be great. So 
So yes, uh, Liz, you can talk about the parenting book. Yes, we are in the process of um, working with our publishers and putting together a parenting book for raising an emotionally resilient child using the DBT Step Safe skills. And so we're hoping, you know, with the slowdown of everything that like by 2021, that will be out there. In the interim, um, that's why I launched the Facebook group of Raising an Emotionally Resilient Child. So we could still be getting resources out there um, to families and parents and to continue and start dialogue around the struggles families are having. And the same thing with the Parenting Through COVID-19 live stream, which where, I, where the student skills class is gonna end in June, we plan to continue the parenting live stream indefinitely as well as opportunities to provide those resources until the book does come out. On the uh, element, was it element you said in two? Nope, that okay. was not a question yet. Okay, sorry. You're getting ahead of yourself. I'm ahead of myself. Okay. Um, I have a question. Is it is it true that your house, that you guys never lose it? <laughs> like, like in <laughs> no. the sense that, <laughs> We can bring so our we can bring our kids that we've in the know, know. One of the things that I find when I watch this and I wonder about other parents watching this is that you, you all seem to have it all together so much, you know. And I know on your parenting live sessions that you've talked about moments that you've lost it. But like, I guess the real question embedded here is like, how do you after you've screwed up, right? And you're using DBT curriculum as a way to kind of potentially reset how it's going yeah. during COVID-19 because I yeah. know many of my parent friends are struggling. You know, how do you reset with your, your kids around that when you kind of made those mistakes? Um, and is it true that you guys are as perfect as you seem? We are far, 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 far from perfect. No, no, I am. I'm good. I'm perfect. <laughs> <laughs> no, so absolutely <laughs> not, right? And so so we, we make mistakes. And one of the things that I've had to learn um, probably a little bit later on in life here is, is that when we, when we mess up, when, we, when, when, when our emotions get the best of us and we're an emotion mind and we either do, uh, yell at each other, right? Mm -hmm. Or I'm upset with, with the kids. I have to come back and say, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I have to come back and say, that was not okay. Emotion mind was driving the bus. And I've got to I've got to work on that. So I am sorry if I hurt your feelings. I'm sorry for what I said. I'm sorry for the tone, right? And that's one of our skills anyway, right? So we want to we want to be able to validate that our kids were were scared at that point, or that you know that we we messed up. And so I think that's really important because we want our kids to take responsibility for their own actions, right? And I watch kids, and we've got one of our sons who likes to give everybody else it's everybody else's fault that that he didn't do well, right, or something along those lines. I'm like, oh no responsibility comes back to you our responsibility which is something you've had to practice to learn all and time. model all the right. time so like, our, like, like, our, like she's doing right in now our right? imperfections and it, i'll tell you what it's really hard to be married to a dbt therapist because then she points out all those different things i right? thought it was a gift and so <laughs> she says i'm just giving you constructive feedback and i'm like i would like my wife back <laughs> so uh so i think that we we do not have a a perfect uh relationship. I mean, we, we get upset with each other. We get, we get frustrated with our, our kids. Our kids get frustrated with us. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard. I mean, when, you know, in just this past week, Grace has been crying over something that's been really hard. And I just, I want to say, I want to say, this is nothing to cry about. Right. That's the first reaction. I'm like, stop. And sometimes that's, we do. That's invalidating. So, right. Right. And so that takes a lot of work though. And so I say, come on over here. And I just give her a hug. Right. I just need to be there. To, to give her a hug, sorry that you're sad. I mm -hmm. can see how this is upsetting to you, right? That piece alone is good, yeah. right? And then I can go from there. And so it's, it's recognizing that we crossed over a limit and that our emotions were, were getting mm -hmm. the best of us. Yeah. I'll, my, I'll I was just saying, my favorite line is when I'm wrong, I say I'm wrong. And it's time to go back and repair. And just for me, because I sometimes am and I do get angry and, you know, Jim and I both have a tendency to be sarcastic at times, which in moments of frustration comes across as quite snarky. Yep. And so to notice when that snarkiness comes out really quickly, to be able to acknowledge it and then go back and apologize. I think that's something that we practice. It's hard for both of us. We've had to do a lot of work on it. And the biggest reinforcer is being able to model that for our kids. So yes, we all hit emotion mind at 
times. And I'm so glad somebody recognized that that was a dirty dancing quote. Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. I say it all the time. Um, and if you watch our parenting live stream, you'll hear the stories of when we get into motion mind, where we struggle um, as partners as a, and as parents. Great. Uh, Go ahead, Jen. Well, I was going to, um, um, now we're getting some questions in the Q&A box. Yeah. Okay, great. And I wanted to take one, one more related to parents. And then there's a couple of questions I want to direct towards the folks who are on the phone who are educators. So here's a question that's come in um, that's related to what we were just talking about. So anxious and mood unstable kiddos often have a tendency to vibe negatively, even when you use lots of validating language and all the skills to help them de-escalate. Yep. When the conversation is repetitive and you're starting to lose your patience, yep. how do you exit or gently leave that conversation without leaving your child feeling abandoned? Okay. You want that one or you want to take it? I'm happy to take it. Um, okay. I think the first thing is the person is right. Like you've, if you start noticing that you're getting dysregulated, yep. your emotions are going up as a parent and you're not being as effective. I think one of the things to do is to just communicate that. Like I notice I, my emotions are starting to get high. I'm starting to go into emotion mind. I'm going to step away for five minutes, give them the time frame, just so I can re-regulate and come mm -hmm. back and be a more effective parent for you. I know, I think you need me right now. And I want to show up 100% for you. And so mm -hmm. I'm going to step away and I will be back. Mm -hmm. right? I think that's a re to communicate what you're doing in a calm and loving voice in that. Right. And it, there are times too, if you happen to whoever had asked that question, if you happen to have a partner too, there are times when I've stepped in, Liz's voice is going up and I can tell she's lost her patience. And I'm like, okay, you need just time. Go, go for a walk for five minutes. We're down to the end of the block. Just go. And she doesn't even question it anymore because uh, mm -hmm. we've learned because it's usually me that has to go for the walk. She's like, you're not being effective anymore. And I'm like, yes, I am. I, I'm, you know, I, I start being, I was like, yes, I am. She's like, do you hear yourself? I'm like, yes, I do fine. I'm going for a walk. Right. And so, and, and she's right because I want to be effective. The value of me being a good father and a patient father is really good. Patience though is not my long suit. I already know that. And so I have to, and I see it in my kids. So I have to be able to see that. And so this person who asked the question, if they've got some uh, child that's like moody or anxious and they think, oh my gosh, that looks a, lot, a little bit like me, then I would say, okay, take that time, right? So if you've got tap out, you know, like if you, or give someone else the baton for the, that, those five minutes, if you have that, if you don't do exactly what Liz says, set a timer, go for five minutes, I'll be back, right? As long as they're safe, right? And they're not gonna burn down the house and then come back and say, so look, you and I both have strengths. Right now, we're not, we're butting heads on our negative stuff. I know you're a good child. I know your heart. I know what you want to do. And right now, you're having a hard time getting that out, and so am I. So let's, let's stop this spot right here, and let's circle back around to what we do well and how we can support each other, right? And so I think, because we, we often, as parents, get stuck in, in seeing all the things that our kids aren't good at, what they need to be doing better, right? If they got four A's and a C, we're always emphasizing the C. Do more there, right? Oh, you know, and it's hard. And I'm an educator, and I and I see that happening just in me, right? And so we want to make sure that we are also looking at those strengths to to help provide that child of ours some support, right? That you are good. You you've got a lot of it. People love who you are. I love who you are, and it just doesn't always come out that way. And I'm sorry. And so let's go back to strengths. I think I want to add one other piece that's super important is that our kids and our partners don't always need help to feel better, right? Sometimes if they're really sad right. or really anxious, they actually know what to do. I think as parents, one of our kind of pulls naturally is if I see my child hurting, I want to help them feel better. And maybe that could be pushing to change how they're feeling can often be the thing that becomes invalidating and the push. I'll give you an example. If yesterday our daughter was really sad about something that she was struggling with um, in regards to putting flowers in a vase and it wasn't working. And um, 18 hours ago, she ended up like crying on the couch and she was really upset and, you know, asking her like, what are you upset? What do you need? And finally, I just said like, do you need just some quiet time on the couch? And she's like, yeah. I was like, all right, how about, you know, I'm here. And if you want me to come and comfort and talk to you, I will come. Just let me know. Yep. 
All right, so she had to also letting her know that it's okay to sit and be sad on the couch. I don't have to make you feel better <clears throat> right now. And we are available right. when you want us to come and join you. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the cool parts about that is, is that we said to her, you're in emotion mind. And she already knew that from the lessons, right? She knew that what that word meant. She just couldn't get herself out of it, right? She said, I know. And so it's like, I don't need you. Basically, she's like, I don't need you to tell me, dad. I got this. I, I know I'm in emotion mind, right? Mm -hmm. What she wanted to do was to get out of emotion mind. So mm -hmm. she went to the couch, which is a distraction, right? It's part of our accept skills, right? And so, or a self so To improve, right? Yeah. So to take her little mini vacation where she lays on the couch under a bunch right? of blankets. So she was able to do that. And so instead of jumping in as parents, because we want tears to go away, we want some of that pain to go away, what we, what we can do is make sure that they're mm -hmm. safe, right? And say, all right, let me know if you need some help. Let me know if you need a skill. Let me know if you need something from me. Because they do need to have the opportunities to practice these strategies. That's how they learn, right? And so that's why I think the whole helicopter parenting and snowplow parenting and all the other words that we have with it is problematic because we're not giving kids, kids aren't getting over the bumps and bruises because we're not letting them hit anything, right? We're not letting them have difficulties. And I think that they need those difficulties. They need to try to figure things out for themselves and to pick themselves up at times uh, for themselves, right? We're there for the crutches. If they need us and it's a big thing, we're there, right? For the smaller things, not everything needs crutches, right? Right. Great. So I'd like to transition to just a couple of questions that have come in um, that are focused more on the educator side. Yeah. So there's one that's come in that's, I'm here, and I know your curriculum, the way that you've been advertising it is designed for middle and high school students. Yeah. And of course, your student, you have one student that's in elementary school, Grace. And so here's a question. I'm here in the role of elementary school counselor trying to determine if this program would work well for my district's K-5 through building. Any information on how the program looks in that venue would be helpful to me. Yeah. All right, so uh, yeah, so I think that you can do this, right? We've, when we've done trainings around the world, we get this question all the time that the elementary teachers come because they haven't seen anything like this and they're like, can we adapt it to our, our age population? And we're like, yes, absolutely. So you just don't wanna be able, you don't want the same standards that we would apply to a middle or a high school where you're gonna have fewer lessons for your mm -hmm. students. You're, the words are gonna be different and then I think the pace has to be much slower. So we would encourage you to do like project-based learnings, things that the kids can get their hands into doing, right? In a slow way, and then help them learn some of the vocabulary that's there. Because if you can teach them in elementary school, they have, there are some issues that are there. In middle school, those issues change. And in high school, mm -hmm. the issues change again, right? And yet the skills are adaptable and effective for all three of those stages. And so I'm also um, working on, developing the elementary curriculum. So we've had a lot of success with DBT Steps A. So mm -hmm. right now, actually a year ago, uh, working with our publisher to say, okay, look, what about, a, what about a DBT Steps E for elementary kids? So there's two curriculums I'm working on, a K through two and a three through five, because the developmental age ranges there are quite different. And so the lessons mm -hmm. are a lot fewer lessons and it still consists of the four main modules that are in our right. uh, DBT stuff. So right hopefully, now. again, in 2021, we will have that curriculum out. And we have lots of schools who are already adapting the middle school um, curriculum to elementary school. Just like we, and hopefully we've been able to demonstrate that in some of our classes, how what we've done is we've adapted the language for grace. Right? And one of the things that we love about teaching the class with her is she's really good that when we say something, she raises her hand and says, what does that word mean? Right. And so we're able to kind of walk through it. And she's been actually cons consulting with us on the elementary um, curriculum because of the language and been working with us on there. And then just I'll add on to that because I know in our um, questions that people asked beforehand, somebody asked about, well, what about the college aged kid? And I just want to add on that. You are also doing that. You've been teaching um, an undergraduate course at the University of Washington for the last True. four years. Uh, yeah, the wellness um, is nice. um, called Wellness and Resilience in College and Beyond. And so you've been working on that, and you're working with other universities to start teaching that curriculum as well. Correct. And so we took we uh, we uh, up went up upscaled up yeah, yeah I guess maybe upscaled the uh, curriculum. So we were having a lot of college students, and Jen can uh, uh, attest to this here at the University of Washington that we were having kids engage in, in self-harming and suicidal behavior. And so what can we do? And my answer was kind of the same. We got to get upstream. So, you know, so the idea was we took the skills that were in the DBT Steps A curriculum and I put them into a class that I developed that was 10 weeks long called uh, 
uh, wellness and resilience for college and beyond, right? So that we can use them as lifelong skills. And we kind of ran it as a pilot class that was 60 students for the first time that we did it. And the next quarter, we said, can we do this again? They said, sure, we got 90 students. And now we're running it every single quarter. And we have between 400 to 450 students per quarter taking that class. And the biggest thing that we've asked the students there, at the end of, at the, end of the 10 weeks, we say, what else could make this class better? Invariably, many of them say another class. We would like another class. And so I've developed a, another class that's just started this year called Thriving on the Path to Happiness. And so that class, mm -hmm filled up instantly, 120 students. And so what I think is so key about that, I just want to add in, is that we have young adults going to college, choosing to right. pay tuition to take these courses and are on wait lists, which is to me says even more why we need to be teaching it in Earlier. elementary and secondary schools um, where it's part of their education. Mm -hmm. They were mm -hmm. wanting it and they recognize the need for it. Great. So you've talked a couple of ways. Uh, there's a question here on, from the, that came in beforehand. Um, you've talked about a couple of different ways in which it might be adapted for college and um, an elementary school and what it would look like. Can you talk about, in the language of school folks, is I know you think about this curriculum as applicable and important lessons, and I agree, for every student. But you know, trying to work in the, the amount of curriculum that you, you all have developed is challenging in a yeah. school context. And so can you talk about different ways to implement it? And could you see this both DBT Steps A both functioning as a tier one and a tier two program? Or do you really see it as a, you know, a program for every student as opposed to kids who might be at higher risk? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take that one. So I do see it really as we designed it to be tier one, right? That universal level, because we think every kid, even your valedictorian, is going to have times when things don't work out well for them, right? And so I think tier one is where we would like to see it. We uh, have been working with several schools where the, the, the tier one schedule is completely full, right? They're like, I can't, we can't squeeze it in. And so what they've done is they've, they've mandatorily said for all social workers, school psychologists, uh, and Counselor. counselors, right? That DBT Steps A is your first go-to place at tier two, right? So tier two means that these students have some uh, they're at risk for other types of things, right? And so that they have some added needs, either academically or social emotionally. And so the counselors are to run their groups or to have any types of, of their individual sessions to start at that emotional regulation piece first. And so I, I think you could run it that way. You could, it could also run at a tier three level if you want, right? If you had uh, uh, teachers that are, have these uh, classrooms, so what we call uh, emotional behavioral difficulty type of classrooms, right, or kids that are having some of these behavioral issues classes. or self-contained, that you now have a group and you can start to uh, modify your schedule to teach that. Because a lot of our kids show up having uh, academic needs, yet it's the social emotional difficulties that got them there to begin with, right? They're mm -hmm. too anxious, so they can't learn. They're feeling depressed, or they feel like they're not tight. They're not uh, bonded to school. And so they, they're, not, they're not performing academically. Yet, as a school psychologist, if I perform an assessment, I come up with the academic needs, but that's actually just an outcome. It's actually back here under trauma, anxiety, uh, depression, those types of things. And so if I just give them more work, I'm missing what's actually really happening. And so I think you could do um, you know, on all three. Yeah, levels. and I'll say for, I work with a lot of schools and trying to determine <clears throat> where do they implement it. And many schools are different that some schools are able to come in and find space in their universal tier one schedules and put it right in. Other schools say we need to start small, so let's do it as a tier two small group class right. first and then expand it to tier one. So I think there's multiple entry points for different schools. Um, I agree. Putting it in the health, the mandatory health classes that many schools have as a place where they put it in, in their advisory or, or already developed wellness classes is another spot where they put it in. Um, so I think there's schools can be creative and because they are 30 lessons and we know that's long um, and we still think they're all very important we've had some schools who will teach half the lessons in year one and the other half in year two so like a sixth and seventh grade and then again in 10th and 11th grade or right. seven eight and then um nine ten different yeah. ways like that so there's lots of flexibility to right. get the skills to the kids so and when we go to train we try to work with the schools and the individuals and say so where can we push in and it may be the fact that, you know, they do drug and alcohol prevention, they do risky sex, they do bullying, right? All of those uh, issues that are there mm -hmm. take a foundation of knowing when you're being bullied, 
knowing about how to make decisions, right? Those are all mindfulness skills. So we're able to kind of build it in there so that those, those curriculums go lock, lock hand, right? Hand, glove, and, hand and glove, right? So that they actually work together. Lock, lock and key, key. <laughs> glove, and, <laughs> glove and key, right? So, so they're, they're actually t- together that way. And so health becomes a, a pretty easy one to push in because most of the schools, most of the states have health standards, you know, eating well, not drinking, uh, substance use, those things. So we can kind of layer it into there. We've seen also some of the skills being layered into like language arts when they're reading books about uh, people. So the, one of the- And good, social studies. And social studies. So for the reading like history. And so, you know, what did, you know, Napoleon Bonaparte do? What, what was the pride that got in the way? Was he an emotion mind, you know, uh, or wise mind? We talk about the book Wonder, which is a fantastic movie, right? And a lot of the, the fourth grade, fifth grade, uh, language arts people are reading that and so uh, you can see all the different skills layered in, into those as well. Great um, so here's a question because you, you know you are speaking about these different applications of DBT in different you know throughout the school building not just necessarily relegated to like health class. Yeah the um, skills yeah. So first off that requires you know having a broad number of teachers potentially trained in using the skills and so just speaking to the fact that like can you implement DBT steps A in a school without this formal training? That's one of the tr- questions that came in beforehand. Like, and if so, like, how would you go about that? I mean, even if maybe you had one, well, I'll let you guys answer the question and not jump in. So how would you implement it without formal training or can you implement it? So say you have a teacher, for example, who's not really trained in mindfulness. Mm-hmm. Can, so, would you suggest a teacher be training DBT steps who hasn't fundamentally had this training. So let me give you an example of one of our teachers. We had a sixth grade social studies teacher several years ago in Wisconsin come, in Wisconsin come mm-hmm. to us and say, I started teaching it this year. I didn't have any training, but I didn't want to wait. I didn't know if my school was going to let me go to training. And so I just started reading the manual. The lesson plans are written out in such detail that there are scripts, there are examples to go there. So she started reading it and teaching it. One of the um, things that was an advantage for her is that one of the mental health staff, like the school social worker, had some experience in the DBT skills. So she could consult with that um, school social worker while still doing the class herself. And then after a year of teaching it and seeing how well it went, and um, she thought it was really helpful to have the, the lesson plans written as they were, her, the rest of her district and her school got on board so that the following year she and along with several of our other staff came to training and where she was doing really well and doing a fantastic job without any training a year into it after getting the training she said it just helped clarify things so much more so i think both are true yes you can do it without formal training and the formal training will help significantly um, to get you to see the bigger picture of how all the skills fit together in a way that it's not just like, I need this one skill in this moment and this skill in the other moment. The thing that's really unique about the DBT skills and DBT step A is how multiple skills stack together for effective interactions over time. Yep. Mm-hmm. Great. So there's a question that's come in that I think is really important here. It says, I'm a district behavior specialist. We have purchased the DBT Steps A curriculum for next year for our secondary program. The population we serve is primarily underserved. Many students are transient or experience homelessness, and there are large percentages of American Indian and East African students as well as many other cultural representations. I'm wondering how you approach cultural competency in your curriculum and how you are planning to work within those communities. Thank you. Yep. So yeah. we, we wrote a curriculum that was uh, more generic and used kind of our experience to this point. And so when we do our trainings, one of the first things that comes out of our mouth after our introductions is to say, look, we need your expertise because you know your populations, you know the culture of these kids much better than we do. And so, you know, it's hard to write a curriculum for the kids in inner city Philadelphia, in, in Dublin, Ireland, and in Wisconsin. Wa- 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 yeah, in Wisconsin, Wisconsin right? right. So uh, we, we can't do it all there, right? So we actually... Uh, so I'd say to this person, I'd say, teacherize it, right? So we want you to put your professional experience on it. What types of examples have happened with your kids that are there, whether uh, East Indian, whether Native American, whether uh, inner city uh, African American, what types of examples and what types of words can you use that make sense to them, not necessarily our words? So read what we have to say, and then how do you teacherize it? How do you make it unique to your population uh, there? And I'd also say, if this is a 
uh, teacher that's working with more high risk populations, don't go too fast, right? We, we, we say all the time, we'd rather you do 50% of the lessons 100% well than 100% of the lessons 50% well. Give them at least a couple of skills in each of the modules that they can retain. That's the main objective, right? And so we wrote it at a universal level. So we think that the reading levels are going to be uh, pretty high up there. We think that the teachers are going to be fast enough to get through all this in 50 minutes. And if you've got kids that have any type of special needs or need uh, added time, you're not going to get through it all. It's just not going to make sense. And then, so don't try. Don't, don't feel like, oh my gosh, I'm incompetent at doing this. I think what you want to do is to kind of uh, say, okay, I can do these three lessons here from uh, distress tolerance, these three from emotional regulation, and these uh, two from uh, interpersonal effect. This year and then next year, I'll fill Sorry. in the Correct. other ones. Um, so I think there's a balance. We have lots of schools who, um, I was consulting with a school yesterday where it's um, Washington, D.C. in the inner city where, we, again, we have a lot of kids who are transient, homeless, um, at home now where their parents, um, they're taking care of younger siblings and right. uh, showing up to their live Zoom or Google Classroom is not as high on the priority for some of the kids as where do I go find food or how do I watch over my younger sibling during this time and getting our teachers and um, our school staff working with them to use the skills that are in the relevant priorities to them in that moment is what's important like yes we want you to show up at school but we're not focused we're recognizing what your priority is and what how things are different for right. you versus maybe what it's like for a kid in the seattle public schools you know and meeting their needs and that's where we really look at it as any school we work with is not about Jim and I or our team coming in as the experts and here's how you teach it, but as a partnership for how do we collaborate and work together to figure out how these skills and the examples best fit your students in relevancy. Yeah, we try to figure out how to come alongside you because you're the expert in, in your school, you know the system, you know the students. And so uh, far be it from us to tell you how to do that, right? And so we want to come alongside you and kind of partner with you so you can tell us what, what you need and we can give you some of the information that we have regarding the skills. And so I, I'm recognizing time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so we have one more question. Can I ask one more question or do you want to say And that? then we'll answer quickly with it rather not All in right. our long-winded way. All right, we'll see. Okay, well, it's, it's, it's really just relevant to the, today's time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, each of us has been affected by the pandemic. You say emotion mind. We actually have spent the last few months in a primal state of flight, freeze, flight, freeze, 24-7. Yeah. This collective trauma has brought back unknown individual trauma impacts on each of us, children included. Right. The new, not the new normal. No. What modifications to your program curricula take in, of this into account? So well, in other I, words, he, this person is actually saying it's not the new normal, like this has been a, a collective trauma on all of us. Right. So what, what does, your, does your, your curriculum and the way you're teaching it, do you, do you think there's any modifications that would be needed? To adapt to that new framing of the situation. So uh, I, I think the question. This is going to be a long answer. So I, I think that, I think there's there's two things here. You couldn't pick a shorter question. Couldn't give me a couldn't give it me a Sorry. yes no question. <laughs> Sorry. So there's going to be a systematic accumulation, right? The system has this accumulation trauma that's happened, right? So that's that's accumulated, and the individual within it also has their own experiences, right? So I think there's two different levels. We're going to have individual. Uh, types of um, interventions that have to happen with their own individual needs and what, what's occurred. And then we're going to have a system a piece as well. And so the curriculum is designed at that individual level mm -hmm. uh, versus the system. And so I do hope that the system is shocked enough, shocked the word, yeah, I'll, I'll be shocked, to say, hey, guess what? We can't go back to just worrying about academics. This, this whole thing has happened. We've got kids who are going to be the future leaders who need to be able to figure this out. Our system has to start worrying about this, uh, this accumulation of trauma that's happened and COVID has kind of added some of the gas. And I, I'm just gonna quickly say, I think COVID-19 and the DBT Steps A curriculum, they fit so well together because a core part of the curriculum and the skills we teach is about mindfulness, mindfulness. and radical acceptance of the current reality. Right right? To help us get grounded in this very true collective trauma that both the adults, the students, and families are all experiencing and putting that out there in the forefront and then kind of applying skills to the current reality. 
right? It's not about keep looking back. It's about being here now and understanding all the things that have impacted us. That's a really short answer to a big question. So hopefully when we come back next month, we can continue on this topic as well. So here's what I want to say uh, before Jen asked that question is, if you're uh, one of those people that are both an educator and a teacher, and you're working with a population that is uh, more at risk, so tier two or tier three, or you're working with elementary, give us an email, and I'm happy to share with the, the order that Liz kind of talked about, the, the sixth grade versus seventh grade. You know, we've got those scheduled out with the, with the curriculum, what skills to teach in sixth grade and seventh grade, right? We also have a little schedule figured out for what to teach in grades three through five or K through two as well, right? And so they still align with the DBT Steps A book until the Steps ebook comes out. Yeah. I'm happy to share that with you. And you can go to our website of dbtinschools.com to subscribe to our mailing list and to um, just leave us questions. There's a connect with us box where you can send questions to us as well. Great. Right. So I'm going to, I'm going to wrap this up and turn it. Kelsey, do you want to turn it, take it now? Sure. Uh, you guys hi, are awesome, everyone. by the way. Thank you both. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. You're amazing. We appreciate you so much. Thanks, everyone, for time. Just a huge thanks um, to uh, the Mazas and to Dr. Stuber for moderating. This is a really fun format. I know our traditional formats are kind of a lot of content followed up with just a little bit of Q&A because we go over time and we don't have time for the questions and answers. So I really enjoyed this format. Um, I want to thank you all again. I want to thank the participants for being with us today. Megan is putting some things in the chat. So your link to the evaluation is there. Again, encourage you to fill out the evaluation. That's really helpful to us. We'll also use that information to um, structure or restructure um, the next session that we have with the Mazas. We wanna invite you back um, with us on June 16th um, for the next Q&A session with the Mazas. We hope you can catch either some of the live sessions or the recorded sessions. Um, and so that was really, this is kind of a wrap for the Q&A and I want to thank everyone again. And we're going to leave the room open for a little bit because we know we have put quite a bit in the chat um, for folks. We want to give them the opportunity to access those links. Um, I'm going to have Megan also put her email in the chat box. Um, if folks have um, additional questions or they miss something or they miss some of the links. We just want to make sure people know how they can reach out um, to us for additional information. So with that, I think I will sign off and um, we hope to see folks back here on June 16th. Be well, everyone. <laughs>